All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we we're talking a little bit about a topic that is, I think, very different from the typical mobility topics that you know you see at the, the CES uh, for the show so far in between the vehicles that we are. But it's one, nonetheless, that is super exciting. Uh, we are here with uh, Patrick, who is the founder and CEO of the Indoor Lab, and we're going to talk all about the uses of LiDAR and sensing perception and software for applications beyond automotive, specifically for industrial sensing applications uh, for security. So the, con to, uh, the context of the conversation today will be a little bit about uh, the use of uh, the products with Indoor Lab, use of LiDAR, uh, software services, and the significance of monitoring applications in airports and other uh, use cases. So uh, really excited to have you here, Patrick. Um, you know, maybe we can first start by talking a little bit about your attraction in the airport space. You mentioned some of the areas you're working with. And how do you see um, the significance of sensing and perception in there? But why, why does it matter um, to use LiDAR versus cameras in the airports? And how do you see that market kind of growing and evolving? Yeah, so we see LiDAR is going to be the base technology in the future and cameras are going to be the supplement, supplemental technology. In fact, um, JFK New Terminal 1, which is one of the premier airports being built today, uh, we are going to be deploying AVA sensors, which I think is going to be the largest uh, LiDAR mesh network in the United States of America when that is deployed. Well, the reason the, reason the change is happening is because when you think of false positives, and um, I'm going to give you a case in point. So what a lot of people don't understand right now is that as we redo these airports in the United States of America, people are building these big, beautiful security checkpoints. And in that process, what a lot of people don't realize is that when you're land side versus air side, there's a lot of opportunity to throw things. And that's what's happening. So people are throwing things such as guns, drugs, knives from land side to air side to assemble the guns on the other side. And this is not just a one-off, this is happening at a lot of airports. So we were brought in to solve a problem they had been trying to solve with LIDAR. So because we can understand body mechanics and the fingers and things leaving the fingers, we can track that object streaming through the air and we're doing this at Denver airport. And uh, we can follow the stream, we can turn the perpetrator red, and where cameras come into play is then we take the telemetry data and we point at the individual. And we can do that in real time. And so this is happening as we speak. JFK New Terminal 1, as it's being built, they're looking at doing this. Tamp International Airport is doing this. And we are um, going live here in the next two weeks at uh, Denver International Airport at the new East Check or West Checkpoint going into the triple escalators. So a lot of a lot of the capabilities that we're talking about is to take some of the challenges that we've had with cameras where the false positives are enormous and immense. And I'll give you an example, uh, MTA, Metro Transit Authority in New York City. I was in headquarters where they had all of the cameras looking at all the bridges and tunnels. And they have a team of people that are just there to look and click on all the false positives that are coming in second after second. And we're going to put an overwatch system over RFK bridge for MFT, uh, M MTA. And we're going to be able to actually watch everything around that bridge with LiDAR and a mesh network. And we will then trigger the camera to point at the perpetrators. So it's going to be the base technology. So we're not talking about hundreds of thousands of units. We're talking about millions of units, and I'm starting to see that happen. And with AVA, there's a new rail system that's being, uh, well, it's a, it's a rail system that exists today that we're going to be deploying with Dell. And we're starting with a two-mile section, but it's going to go from Miami all the way to Orlando. And that's going to be, I think we have something like 7,000 units uh, of AVA units scheduled for that in 2026. So obviously we talked about a lot of different applications already. Really exciting. I think obviously one of the things for us that's exciting is um, being able to provide a sensor that we have designed from the ground up for automotive, great quality, that is reliable, that's robust, that can withstand different environmental conditions. And then really using that to scale. And as you mentioned, you know, we're not talking about just like handful of units. This is, you know, going from thousands, tens of thousands and, and beyond from there. Um, you know, you've been in the space for a long time. You have work with a number of technologies. You mentioned that the key here is there's going to be still combination of sensors, LiDAR being the primary, and then you also use cameras. Mm -hmm. What has your experience been like working with LiDAR technologies? And 
maybe talk a little bit about, obviously, you know, we're here at the Ava booth and, you know, I am mm -hmm. biased, of course, but why, why uh, Ava? It's interesting. So look, go, let's go back to 2015 when spinners, right? So you've got the rotationals and that's what the first was available to us. And so as we went into the uh, early, uh, we were the first to bring LiDAR into the NFL, Atlanta Falcons for um, AMBSC. And we also brought it in Home Depot. And the meantime, to failure issue, uh, when you have mechanical units, spinning was a problem. So then we migrated over to directional LiDAR and we've stayed with directional LiDAR. So if you're not a bot droid or drone, directional LiDAR is what's used for fixed uh, installations, period, end of story. So not only do we have to deal with outside and inside, even though the name says the indoor lab, which is really, we're changing our name because we do more outside than inside. But when you start to look at being able to deliver a product that has a high dense, long range compression capability or delivery to where we can actually deliver it and have 20 sensors on a server and then mesh that together with another set of 20 on a server into an aggregation network, um, a lot of the things that's coming up with, uh, coming uh, to light with Ava is um, going down the path where we believe uh, the airports want to go. And it's not only uh, velocity detection that they have built in FMCW, um, being able to see through fog, things of that nature, but also um, they are developing with, uh, in conjunction with us, a POE version. So all you have to do is plug a uh, cat six with a uh, RJ 45 into the back of it. And um, that's what airports want. Every, if you think of an airport having 500 sensors and you're sitting in a situation where you've got 500, but now you got multiple points of failure. So if you do not have POE, now you got a splitter, an adapter. And so each one of those is a point of failure. And, and one of the things that uh, was very exciting for us with working with Ava is their adaptability to go into the non-automotive market, which is anywhere there is a camera today is going to be displaced by LiDAR in the future or supplement LiDAR uh, or supplement cameras in the future. So the total available market is very, very big. Yeah, really helpful. I think, you know, one of the things that excites us um, as, you know, the, the sensor provider here is that uh, while the applications are broad, um, the volume opportunity obviously is massive. Mm -hmm. um, there is airports you talked about, there is uh, trains, there is others. There's a lot of, but while those are the different kind of uh, applications, there is basically the same kind of product with, okay, maybe different customizations in how integration happens or software or things like that. But we don't need to, you know, provide to you, for example, a bunch of different SKUs of the products. And that's, mm -hmm. I think, is one of the very exciting things for us, which is it allows us to really scale based off of the existing Atlas product yeah. and then um, help, you know, your team to support these different various applications, each with really interesting, unique uh, end use cases and each with uh, quite tangible and large opportunities. So uh, I think maybe uh, we're coming, I think, a little bit close on time, but I want to talk a little bit about where do you see uh, the overall market for uh, monitoring and security going? You talked about the opportunity being quite massive. Where do you see specifically the focus for, for the indoor lab being? Is it more on the airport side? Is it more on the you know, commercial train? Yeah. How do you think about so, that? So let me bring up that one screen real quick, if you guys could. So the sensors, mind you, this is gates 8, 9, 10, and 11 at... Uh, Tampa International Airport Terminal A, but notice how you're looking at everything top down, even though the sensors are against the wall. So the world of, um, the reason we stuck with airports first is we now have an entire ecosystem across the airport. So we built this platform, which is um, probably the most robust enterprise platform across the airport. And we knew that if we did that, because you're tracking trucks, buses, planes, people, safety, security, things like that, we can slice off and go into adjacent markets. So the first reason was go into airports. I knew the air, airport space very well. And from there, uh, it's recession proof. It's COVID proof. They didn't shut down. So everything about our business was when in the airport space, I have uh, now roughly 10 of the top 30 airports. And um, once we win at that, we'll have a platform across uh, the ecosystem of an airport. And then uh, as we were brought in by Dell to fix this train problem, we used that platform to do it and we were able to solve the problem really quickly. And so what's happened in the market is uh, about a year and a half to two years ago, we went from a lead gen company to an intake company. 
So we no longer are going after business. We're just trying to keep up at this point. So the market has started to request LIDAR because they've seen it uh, in execution now for a few years. And, um, and so I just uh, believe that you can go anywhere with this, right? So if you think of anywhere, but you can get shiny ball syndrome. So focus is the key. And so we want to be the best at what we do. And um, in doing so, we've worked with multiple LIDAR providers. And as we start to narrow and focus, um, we're, we're looking at companies that we believe are on the cutting edge and have long life to the company. So we don't have to be at the tip of the spear and then have to change manufacturers every other, other year. Yep. Yeah. Very helpful. I think, uh, you know, as, as we kind of wrap up on, on this discussion, we talked a lot, a lot about, okay, different applications, airports, mm -hmm. trains, there is, you know, parks and others in terms of scaling. What do you think the, you know, if you, if you fast forward, you know, five years from now to seven years from now, what do you think um, is the most exciting trend that you see in the industry relevant to your applications, relevant to perception and, and monitoring in terms of trends that you see that you, you think is going to be leveraged by this availability of LIDAR and, and the primary sensing modality? Yeah, so... So it wasn't just about detecting people that are doing nefarious activity, it's doing something about it. So when we were brought into this rail company that is having to deal with su suicides at the rail system and or um, if you think about, uh, you know, people just getting hit by trains, well, the train system hasn't changed in 80 years, right? You just have the same ding, ding, ding crossing. So what we see the trend happening is we are fabricating mechanical solutions uh, to supplement LIDAR to fix these problems. Every week, you don't even know the stats because it's not public, um, but the stats are in the rail systems in the United States. When you talk about people getting killed, they're getting killed weekly. Uh, and so we see the trends um, starting to go from just counting people. That was 10 years ago for us. But, you know, thinking about LIDAR counting people, counting cars, we're not doing that. We're actually solving problems with LIDAR and using cameras to uh, catch perpetrators uh, and or um, stop people from jumping off of bridges, uh, stop people from actually falling into the tracks and getting killed by the train. Um, so I believe that you're going to see once we start to launch some of these products, people are going to start to understand that it's not just LIDAR in mesh network, but LIDAR with mechanical things that have been de developed for other industries that are going to help keep us safer in the future. Got it. Really helpful, I think, and maybe in just in summary, you know, you're talking about a lot of different applications, but the core of it is enablement by LiDAR sensing yep. with smart software. Of course, there's AI involved, but, you know, if, if not, that's okay. And then there is also on top of that mechanical systems or robotic systems that all together solve a set of problems and not just we're beyond the stage of just monitoring and counting alone. And you see this application from airports to uh, commercial trains to other types of transport that is uh, really becoming critical. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because when you have to will and shift a market from cameras to LiDAR, uh, it, took, it took about eight years for us to actually get there. Um, nobody even wanted to listen. Nobody wanted to hear about it. Um, so until you got a few deployments under your belt and you started to prove what it could do, then you had, you had to have those with the reason I did a seven year deal with Tampa international airport is I needed a lab. They became my lab. Then they were bringing people in and showing them what, what they were accomplishing with LIDAR. And that was probably the biggest turning point. Um, but it is truly the next generation of opportunity of, of, uh, technology, um, and keeping us safer, uh, building solutions that, uh, solve problems from even kidnapping in entertainment facilities. There's a whole host of things we're doing with someone coming to a family that doesn't belong to the family unit and grabbing a child and bringing the child away. So we're able to do things uh, around child trafficking and things like that. So I think we're, we're embarking on things with AI and LIDAR that uh, just the tip of the spear, if you talk to me five years from now, I'm sure I'm going to have a whole host of things that have going to change from today. Very fascinating. I think there's so many applications here. I think we could, you know, spend uh, probably hours talking about the topic. Yep. But I think um, for me, maybe just uh, last words, I think is uh, really exciting to see that there is the here and the now opportunity. Of course, there's always the future and the potential in terms of volume scaling. But these are problems that are being solved at, at the airports, at other, you know, parks or other sites that you mentioned that are in the here and the now. And there is actual scale needed to deploy that. And um, I think 
uh, the the strength of our partnership in having okay a strong partner that can help provide the software aspects has all those channels through key customers and partners and the experience for decades in these airports and other sites. I think combined with okay unique technology from our side with FMCW with the advantages of velocity. Uh, immunity, and most important, I think scaling and be able to put everything down on the chip level, design for automotive, but then now add some uh, customizations to make it work for really for, industri- for for these industrial security applications, um, I think really makes a perfect partnership. So I, I, I want to thank you for uh, joining us here today, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more about this. In the Absolutely. Future. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.